Okay. I think we are about assembled. So I feel a little bit silly in. Uh, oh, wait till yeah. I feel a little bit silly uh, introducing Nigel because I think you already know him, all of you. However, just in case someone wandered in from the street, dis despite the security, <laughs> let me do it anyway. So Nigel got his PhD from uh, University of Kent, and he's been a professor at Bristol uh, since 2000. And a lot of people here uh, have passed through his uh, group. Uh, Nigel have contributed uh, similarly and massively to a lot of sub-areas of crypto, and it's, I don't want to enumerate them, but in particular elliptic curve stuff, fully homomorphic encryption, side channel uh, analysis, and, and things like that. But the reason why he's here today is he has contributed also uh, very importantly to multi-party computation, in particular in making it uh, practical. So if you s take a look at, at Nigel's papers, it looks like he always insists on keeping things real, at the, as they call it in the US. Keeping, s I mean, the pr it's also consistent with having, I mean, founded the Real World Crypto Workshop, right? It's a small workshop. Uh, it's only about the size as, as our <laughs> workshop, uh, our conferences here. Um, Bigger. Which is about real world crypto and uh, some years ago, he started doing the same to multi-party computation. He was among the very first to start publishing papers showing that multi-party computation could actually be practical. So we decided to invite him today and have him tell a little bit about how that looks from his view between, a, I don't know, between a rock and a hard place or between the ideal world or, and the real world. But, okay. but also, I mean, for the one that know him, you know, he's, he has a very shy, tending to coy nature. So help me <laughs> welcome him uh, and encourage him here. So. Okay, so um, this is between the ideal and the real world, so I'm going to kind of stand here because <laughs> over here we have the ideal world, it seems, and over here we have the real world. Um, yeah, so I've got to work out how to use this thing. Okay, what to talk about? So you're invited to give a lecture uh, for the ICR, and um, I should stand there because the camera won't get me, will it? Or maybe, I don't know. <laughs> That's probably better, isn't it, if the camera doesn't get me? It's just not important. Okay. Right, so ignoring the camera, okay. Um, okay, so what do you talk about? So you're invited, and, and, and I've kind of seen, I've been to a lot of cryptos and Eurocrypts and some Asia Crypts and some other things, and you have three kinds of invited talk. You have the, I'm going to really scare you for an hour in all the shit I've done for the last... Um, that's one, by the way. One. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. So I really can scare you for a whole hour on all the stuff I've done for the last year, and it's really, really confusing and, and, and complicated stuff. And I, you know, really convince you that I'm really clever. Um, I'm not going to do that because you've got a huge technical program, and to me, it's hard enough to stay asleep for sorry, stay awake <laughs> for 25 minutes during a technical talk, let alone an hour. So we're not going to do that. Then there's, there's the second type of invited talk, where you get someone who comes up and they explain an area that's really important and has made great strides in the last few years, and they kind of explain where they think that area is and, um, and what it's doing and the kind of open problems they've got. And that's typical of the really excellent invited talk we had yesterday by Gilles, which I thought was absolutely brilliant and a really important area that some of us kind of predicted quite a long time ago um, was, was going to kind of take off, and now it's great to see that it's given invited talk status at a uh, conference like this. And then there's the third type of invite, invited talk, which is kind of like the lazy version, which is what you do is you kind of give a sort of meta talk about all sorts of things and try and tease out different ways that the community um, uh, works and interacts and could, should and do work. So I'm going to kind of do the lazy option and give the sort of meta talk. So I'm going to um, be... Uh, exemplifying um, some of the points I want to make by multi-party computation and some other topics. And also, because someone said, how did you start in crypto? I thought I'd also give a kind of introduction to how I came into the subject and where I come from, to give hope to all you people who actually started in, in crypto as PhD students, you know, that you've actually got an advantage on me. So basically, I want to talk about um, uh, theory versus practice versus theory versus practice. That should probably be practice. I can't remember what I was thinking when I wrote this slide. Anyway, um, 
And the key problem is, what do you mean by theory and what do you mean by practice? Is that one person's theory is another person's practice. And one person's practice is another person's theory. So it, when you kind of... Uh, you kind of and it can, it, people can change. And it, in fact, actually, it changes over time. And this is what I want to kind of stress, is that what is theory should change over time, and what is practice should change over time. So if you have a narrow view of what theory is and what practice is, you are doomed. So this is why I want to kind of... So I'm talking to the youngsters in the audience. Please uh, do be, be more broad-minded than your elder peers. OK. OK, so um, we want... And the, then the question is, how do you measure theory and practice and all shades in between? Now, a common way of doing this, if you're in industry, is use technological readiness levels, TRLs. Now, who's heard of a TRL? OK, right, so this is what I thought. So I thought, kind of in this sort of meta thing, I'd explain TRLs to you. <laughs> uh, this talk is at... Um, it's all shades. <laughs> OK, right, so... So what are technical readiness levels? Well, they're kind of defined by various organisations. There's a DOD version, um, there's a European um, uh, communications version, etc. I just went to Wikipedia and picked the first one, which is DOD, like you do. Um, so I want to ask you is where your research fits. So TRL level one is, you can read it there, it's the lowest level of technological readiness. Um, scientific research, it's transla... It's notice... It begins to be translated into applied research, yeah? So, and development, okay? My examples might include a paper studies of a technology's basic properties, published research that identifies the principles that underlie the technologies, and so on. In some sense, if you're doing theoretical crypto, you should be doing TRL level zero. And that's not, that's not being negative, yeah? This is actually saying this is... If it's theoretical, it shouldn't be ready for deployment. Otherwise, it's not theory, yeah? So, by definition, theoretical crypto is TRL level zero. So, who thinks they're kind of doing work in this space? Okay, there's some people there. Good, 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 good. That's nice. That's nice. Who thought they're doing TRL level zero? Okay, that's nice as well. Yeah, that's just good. We need, we need a balance. I want a balance community. Okay, so... I would kind of say TRL level one is a kind of about MPC in about the 1980s to 2005. It's kind of, you know, it, which we're not actually doing anything, but we're thinking we take this technology, what could we do, what we could do with it? Okay. TRL level what two is what we have concepts and applications are formulated. So we kind of think about, okay, here's this technology, what could we actually use it for? Practical applications are invented. We don't actually do them, we actually invent them. And the applications are speculative. Um, da, 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 what else there? And we just and, we, and examples are limited to analytic studies. We say if we implemented this, what would it look like? Okay, so who thinks they're doing TRL level two? Guys are even worse, right? Okay, so I, I would say it's kind of typical in the 1990s. You know, you can see these papers. You know, we can use MPC to do healthcare data, but we don't actually do it. We can do MPC to do this and so on. So it's about 1990s. Okay, TRL level three. Oh, we got a proof of concept. Who thinks they're doing proof of concept crypto? Yeah, okay, it's getting better, yeah? So it's kind of interesting that we really don't have much between TRL level, we don't have much one, two, but we do have quite a lot of, of three and above, which is kind of interesting and kind of my point. Okay, so we're doing analytic studies, we've got, we've got physically validating the, the predictions, and we've got components, but we don't integrate them. Um, so this is perhaps fair play by Pincus, okay? So this is a really seminal piece of work, and it was actually, we'll come back to fair play in my talk about how important it was to the development of practical MPC. Uh, four, we actually, we got a component and a validation in a laboratory, and we integrate them and see how they work together, and we kind of create a sort of vague ad hoc system in the laboratory. Who thinks they're doing this? Okay, yeah, good, 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 okay. Okay, so this is perhaps typified by things like VIF and speeds. They're not stuff you should use in the real world, but they're stuff... If you don't know what VIF and speeds are, VIF is from Denmark, it's OK. Speeds is from Bristol, it's cool. <laughs> OK, so if you... I'm from Denmark as well. <laughs> I'm from Denmark as well, yeah, that's true. OK, yeah, yeah, and it's from Denmark as well. But VIF is only from Denmark, <laughs> OK. 
Yeah, the speech is from Denmark and Bristol. Yeah, good point. <laughs> okay, and then there's the rest, which is like moving stuff into really, really, um, actually until you finally get product. So who thinks they're working here trying to finally get product as well? Good, okay. So here's examples. Okay, we've got ShareMind. Um, has, is produced by Cybernetica, if you haven't heard about that. We've got Partesia do their sugar beet auction. At some point, I have to make, mention sugar beet auction, so I just got it out, out of the way there. Um, we've got Dadix Virtual HSM, and we have the DARPA Brandeis program, which is producing a secure database with lots of applications in US government and stuff like that. So it's kind of like we actually are producing product that can be deployed in the real world, and in some cases, sold to people. Okay. So this is about translation. What we're trying to do is we're trying to translate the ideal world to the real world, to make them indistinguishable in some sense. Um, so it, it requires uh, research and venues which support this translational research. Now, OK, so what happens is, is that this is often killed in the community. And this is what I want to say in this talk is please don't kill this work, because this work is what gives the theoreticians stuff to do, new theory, and it gives applied people new stuff to work on. But if you kill the transition, you're not gonna, the subject won't progress. So classic ways of killing a paper like this, um, it doesn't contain any new theoretical ideas. Um, it doesn't implement something useful to practitioners. Yeah, it's in the middle. No shit, it doesn't, yeah? Second. Yeah, good, okay. Right. <laughs> got, I think they've got a sweepstake. Anyway. So, um, yeah, so you, you don't want to kill the stuff that does the transition. So please, kind of like this is a call to the elder people in the audience, please don't kill papers that do this translational work trying to turn theory into practice. And I'm going to have some stories as we go through. Okay, so this is like pairing research in the 1990s. And I've got a great story here. Okay, so here's the story of I am to blame. Okay, so what happened in the 1990s, well, early 1990s, you had this Menezes Okamoto Vanstone attack on elliptic curves, which used, is, used cryptographic pairings. And these pairings would map the discrete log on the elliptic curve to discrete log in the finite field. And the whole point was is that what you do is you take an elliptic curve discrete log, you have a polynomial time algorithm to map the discrete log on the elliptic curve to discrete log on the finite field, and then you apply a sub-exponential algorithm to, to break the discrete log. Now, clearly, it is stupid to optimize the polynomial time bit, isn't it? Because the hard bit is the sub-exponential bit. So there were loads of papers submitted to conferences which optimized the polynomial time bit, and me and many others just rejected them out of hand, going, you idiots. This is the bit that's not interesting. Why the hell do you want pairings to go fast? <laughs> that was a mistake. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. But this happened, right? So, you know, the fact that you don't know why this thing you want to go fast now, someone might come up with an application. Where's Antoine? He's here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So. Um, I kind of got my inspiration for this talk from an actually invited talk at a conference, a uh, conference me and Stephen Galbraith organised about 20 years ago, where Brian Birch, who's my PhD grandfather and Stephen's PhD father, um, very famous number theorist in the UK, Birch, Swinnerton, Dyer, Conjecture, and all that kind of stuff, um, he um, actually gave what we started to call Birch's curve. Okay, and what he was trying to do was justify why theoretical pure number theory is a good thing and why. Um, in some sense, he was mapping from the pure theoretical number theory to real applications in like crypto, and he's kind of showing his curve. And so he gave a curve, and it looked like that. So curves always good. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to be using this curve quite a lot because I think it looks quite cool. Okay, so time is going to go on that direction, and theory is going to be at the top left-hand side because it's hard and difficult. And practice is kind of stuff at the bottom, which by definition should be easy because it should be easy for mere mortals to implement and actually use and understand, okay? What's that? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is the ideal world. Yeah, 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 no, but, but there's a point. I want the curve to go down, because there's a graphic later on. I want it to go down, you see. <laughs> anyway, so, okay, so it's conceptually difficult, conceptually easy. Okay, so what else do we have? Um, OK, so where do our conferences sit? <laughs> OK, well, no, th th this is by definition, yeah? 
this is not, this is not controversial. This is TCC. It should be theory. Um, real world crypto, it should be real world. You know, I'm, we, we don't, I'm not saying never the twain shall meet, but this is kind of where they sit. And this is good. So we cover the whole spectrum. Tick. We're good. Um, what about the main flagship conferences? Well, you often hear people say, who are uninformed, that the flagship conferences, they're about theory. No, they're not. The flagship conferences are about everything. And as you see here, we have many talks that are very theoretical, and also here, and very many talks which are uh, applied, also there, but some less there than there are here. I don't know. Anyway, that's my distinguisher. That's the theory side. This is the applied side. Anyway, um, so we have this kind of band of stuff that we want to represent. Um, and we should want our ideas to move down the curve. And we should value people who take stuff from the top to the bottom. You should value me, basically. I'm just what I'm saying. Um, okay, so the inventive step is realizing it can be done. Okay, fair play is a really, really great example. Okay? Okay, so theoreticians hate me because they think I'm a practitioner, and practitioners hate me because I think they think I'm a theoretician. So I upset all of you. So I kind of, I'm kind of happy to upset all of you. Um, and, uh, and many people think I'm a fraud. But, um, Okay, so the, um, I'll get to fair play. I'm going to go for, I keep thinking I've got a fair play story I need to come back to. So, right. Okay, so I'm going to look at some case studies of stuff I've worked on, which uh, Jasper kind of kindly mentioned. Um, and the question is, is what's theory, what's the practice, and whatever. And I'm going to sort of touch what I did on my uh, uh, PhD, S unit equation, which is kind of very similar. Um, and we'll talk about elliptic curve discrete log, fully homomorphic encryption, and multi party computation but mainly multi-party computation. So, okay, the first thing is, is I'm not a cryptographer. Okay? This is what I did my... Oops, sorry. Ah. This is... Oh, laser, which one's that one? Uh, oh, the one with the... But, let's see, look. This is what I did my PhD on. Okay? Looks totally dull, yeah? Because it is. So what you want to do is you want to solve... You're given the eaters, and you want to find the A's and the B's such that this thing true is true. It's kind of like... It's a very theoretical thing... A very, very theoretical set of equations um, came up with in the uh, early 1970s, and they had what's called effective algorithms, which are basically an algorithm that will terminate. So that's all that the mathematicians were cared about, is that the algorithm would eventually terminate. So the question was, is could you have an algorithm that would terminate in your lifetime, would be, uh, or actually in the late age of the universe was kind of some of the things. So we kind of worked on these, and Bernard de Vega is somewhere here who did lots of kind of groundbreaking work. There we go. Lots of kind of groundbreaking work in this area. Um, and the point is, is that they actually have applications, okay, within pure mathematics, within number theory. So in some sense, this is a theoretical piece of number theory, and the application is also in theoretical number theory. But like I say, one man's theory is another one's practice, so that's fine, okay? OK, so let's kind of put them on the curve. OK, so, um, um, so the theory of such equations is about 68 to 72. There were lots of theoretical applications developed between 68 and 80. And then from about 86 to 95, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of papers on actually solving these things in practice and solving mathematical problems and all sorts of interesting things. Practically useless, actually useful, because all the techniques used all sorts of things like lattice reduction, um, used uh, number field theory, all the kind of stuff you see with the cyclotomic number fields to do with um, LWE. All the c there's a lot of class group stuff there that we've seen earlier this, this week. And all that kind of stuff ended up being very useful to me when we did the homomorphic encryption stuff with Craig and Shai. But at the time, it was just done for the fun of it. So fun theory is also cool. Okay. Key point is dare to dream. The point here is, is what we did is we saw there was these theoretical applications and we dreamt we could actually implement them and we went off and did the research and actually implemented them. Our papers essentially contain no theoretical ideas and no impact on practice. But they're kind of important because they kind of show that they developed a lot of the techniques, a lot of how to do LLL, how to do um, encode stuff. Um, we've even seen applications of this recently. Um, we just had a paper at Financial Crypto. Applications of the kind of stuff we did with LLL here to encoding complex numbers within homomorphic encryption schemes. So it's kind of like there's lots of... You never know where the spin-out occurs. Okay? 
So one application was actually finding what's called integral points on elliptic curves, which is an elliptic curve, and you want to find the integer solutions. So that led me naturally to look at elliptic curves, because elliptic curves are more interesting than these things by a long way. OK. OK, so then the question is, is how do you become a cryptographer? So this is the point where I become a cryptographer. OK, so notice I don't know any crypto at this point. OK? Kenny's going, yeah, he didn't, yeah? OK, right, so you have to blag your way through an interview at HP, but you have zero knowledge. So, OK, how do you blag your interview at HP to convince people like Kenny um, that you, should, you are really a cryptographer? It's easy. You spend the day and you read a book. <laughs> OK, so in, in, the, in the late 1990s, this was, um, this was your simulator for lowering the knowledge of crypto, is that you could read this and then you could simulate any answer reasonably well, such that a polynomial distinguisher couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, So this was how you got around it. OK, so then we looked at elliptic curve discrete logarithms. OK, so the big thing here in the early 1990s, getting the tapes right, yeah, is, um, I'm going to recap stuff for youngsters, I'm mainly talking to youngsters, old people can fall asleep, is that what we wanted to do is we wanted to solve the discrete logarithm problem on an elliptic curve over a finite field extension, over e, uh, elliptic curve over the fa uh, Gower field of GFQ to the N, OK? Now, for those of you, who, uh, everyone heard Gower? Actually, the road just down here, very close to is where he lived. So he's not, not 50 yards from here, or, or metres in, in, in this country, um, is, is, is where Gower lived. OK, so how we do this is there's this method called Vey descent, which was kind of this very old kind of technique from the 1940s, uh, Vey descent. And what you do is you kind of think of the, you kind of change your view, you change your spectacles, and instead of thinking of things over a finite field, of q to the n, you kind of expand the number of variables and consider it as a complicated algebraic variety um, in a bigger dimension but over a smaller finite field. So instead of having a big fat finite field with a small dimension, you have a thinner finite field but a bigger dimension. You kind of just change the way you look at things, OK? And then there's all sorts of stuff you have to do and blah, 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 and maybe this would work. OK, so. No one knew about this, right? So the point was, this was first outlined in a talk of Gerhard Frey at Waterloo in 1998, OK? And then Stephen and I, we kind of thought, oh, that's a cool idea. I wonder if it's going to work. So we then wrote a paper um, which, which basically says, mapped out exactly the steps you would have to do, what the kind of things would have to work, to kind of put the flesh on Gerhard's idea. And, and, and playing around with examples, playing with examples, another key thing, don't, you know, don't just do the theory, do the, do the equations as well. So playing around with examples, we actually realised it was all rather magic and stuff would pop out that shouldn't pop out that was kind of, kind of cool. So you would actually generate, lying in this weird algebraic object, was this lovely curve that would sit there that would describe things and you could then map discrete logarithms over. And it all kind of worked magically for special finite fields. Okay? Um, so then being a bear of very little brain, I uh, roped in a, a very good German mathematician called Florian Hess, who could do all the maths and do all the theorems, and a great uh, French uh, computational number theorist called uh, Pierre Goldry. And we actually, did, we actually did some examples and proved that the examples that we'd come up with, um, using just parry, just playing around with parry, were, um, were actually useful, and you could actually break discrete logs that no one thought you could break before. And this was kind of cool. Um, Again, we just have this piece of theory, and so the idea was is just, just think, what happens if you try and apply the theory? Just what happens if you try and apply the theory? You do this a million times, sometimes it actually bloody works. Three. Bloody count, does it? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, then uh, we use this technique of isogenies to kind of uh, make things uh, better. Make things much faster. So a lot of the stuff here, so a lot of uh, Stephen Galbraith's work on isogeny cycles and understanding how isogenies work with elliptic curve have kind of been they're kind of similar to the kind of stuff you see in the SIDH problem that was discussed uh, yesterday. Okay. Second lesson: write papers with people whose names started with G and H. <laughs> very important to have let, uh, papers GHS because it's kind of it's very. Kind of seems to work for me anyway. Okay, 
Okay, so what was the summary is that someone came up with a theory, you realize you can implement it, you start building techniques for implementing it, um, and then we got a theory of, series of papers which turn that theory into practice just by daring to dream that you could actually do it. Okay, similar work um, on FHE. There was a, a paper by Gentry. Um, so Fraver, Couch, and I decided, could you implement it? We mainly decided, could we, could we implement it, because we couldn't understand it. So there was uh, a Gentry's thesis was very complicated. If you're everyone who read Gentry's thesis, it's incredibly complicated, and we couldn't understand it. So we thought, can we simplify it enough such that we understand it? And the point was, is we actually, uh, uh, well, that was the wrong way around. So we actually uh, simplified it enough that we could actually implement it. And it was kind of like weird. We had this kind of thing coming out. We implemented it. And went, oh, it actually works. Oh, my God. And then we, we got an integer out as the ciphertext action happened. And we kind of then, we actually rebuilt the theory from the actual example. So we had, were sitting next to each other going, that shouldn't happen. And then we kind of like, a day later, oh, yeah, it should. That's meant to happen. And, and so, so the, what's called now called the um, smart for Kauteran, uh FHE scheme, or she scheme, or whatever you want, is, um, was actually came out from doing examples and actually playing, going, oh my god, it's actually easier than we thought. Okay? However, the scheme is now considered broken. Not. But the point at the time was to actually show that you could do homomorphic encryption. So it was this, and then the resulting, also the library that uh, Shai and uh, Craig came up with, which also implemented essentially the same scheme, which was the thing that kind of kicked off um, homomorphic encryption could be practical, yeah? And so it could be useful in some things, which then kicked off DARPA to fund the Proceed program and all sorts of other things that follow from that. Okay. So again, the story is you take some theory, you see whether you can implement it. Um, okay, so, uh, and then, so we started actually looking at, well, what, we could implement some stuff, so let's start looking at um, implementing AES for reasons which we'll come to later why we implement AES, okay? So um, I, I teamed up with Gentry and Halevi and said, okay, let's implement AES. So the start of our working together was let's implement AES. And to implement AES, we actually had to build everything else from. So all the stuff on the polylog paper about the, you know, the asymptotically efficient FHE stuff all comes because we were trying to implement AES. So all the, all the stuff on the faster bootstrapping was because we were trying to implement AS. And, and along the way, we came out with new bits of theory, new bits of stuff that allowed us to do that. So all the stuff to do with slot manipulation, all this SIMD stuff in FHE, um, the double CRT representation, which is kind of like trivial if you think about it for a minute. There's modulus switching up. There's all the stuff to do with the Waxman networks, which actually then required us to understand how, how Galois groups act on principal ideals, which then went back to the work I'd done in the, on my PhD. So there's all kind of stuff that's kind of there. Um, and only in the third of the papers did we actually implement AES. So it's actually, again, implementing something that actually generates new theory, which is kind of cool. OK, so where we have, we have Gentry's Theresis. We have the, uh, my implementation with Frey and Craig and, and Shai's implementation. Then we have the GHS implementation. And then we have the HE lib stuff comes from that. There's lots of bits of HE lib I still recognize some of the code in. All the bad bits, I must say, are my code. Uh, the, all the good bits, Victor and Shy have improved dramatically. Um, then there's limited applications. So in the HEAT project, EU-funded HEAT project, we're evaluating neural networks. There's the stuff MSR have been doing with the SEAL library that was, was talked about by Martin earlier today. Um, and they're also doing all, all sorts of... Uh, kind of genome processing and stuff like that. So we actually have limited applications now of homomorphic encryption, which is kind of like weird, yeah? Like, who, th who thought that you would have an application of homomorphic encryption at this point in time? Yeah, two. <laughs> That's pretty, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you, okay? So again, it's dare to dream. Can you implement the theory? But we seem to have hit a brick wall. We don't seem to be able to push homomorphic encryption any further. There's lots of theory stuff going on, but in terms of practical, can we get it to run faster? Can we do better stuff? We seem to have hit a brick wall. So we probably actually need a really good application to try and do stuff in. So we're looking at the floating point, or like I said, the complex number stuff in the heat project. There's some neural network stuff, which might push the theory, might give us examples on how to push the schemes a bit more faster. 
Okay, and the thing is, is if we pick, that's the point, so if we pick other challenges there, other implementation challenges, can you actually use homomorphic encryption in those implementation challenges? So that would be, be a cool thing to do research on, please, because this brick wall is really annoying. Okay, so now we come to multi-party computation. Okay, so let's see where it was. Okay, so there was a lot of work in the 1990s and 1980s on theoretical MPC, and it was great. We got the foundational basis of what we can do with MPC. And at the time, or sort of early crypto, so early 1990s, there were kind of two types of talks. So you're, you're, you're in Santa Barbara, it's nice and sunny outside, you know. Okay, the stream cipher sessions come on, you leave. <laughs> the multi-party computation sessions come on, you also leave. Because this is just kind of pointless, yeah? This is never going to work. What's the point of wasting half an hour when there's sunshine outside? Okay, so this is it's my view, okay? Some of you were more clever and you stayed, okay? So Divan was very clever and stayed. Not sure about stream cipher sessions, but there we go. <laughs> stayed for the multi-party <laughs> multi computation sessions, but some idiots he just... Was giving the talk. <laughs> Ah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, to stay. <laughs> or sharing the session or something. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the question is can you implement the theory? And then Fairplane came along. Okay, so I was sitting, this was at the Interlaken, for Christian and Jan were organizing it, Interlaken Eurocrypt, and we had this weird cow with a bell and other stuff, which, like, yeah, you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> we had these. Looking forward to the rump session tonight. I don't know what animal they're going to bring along, but there we go. Um, so we had uh, so so uh, Benny got up in a two-minute rump session talk. He start he put his laptop down, says I'm going to run an experiment, and he typed in Alice Bob, da 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 rum program. He then talked for the two minutes, and as his two minutes were up, it came up that integer a was less than integer b. Yeah. He could do a 32-bit comparison in two minutes, but what was more impressive, live in a rump session, because that, you know, that's kind of like, okay, so at that point I went, oh shit, I should have paid attention to those talks, because it was clearly this was not a piece of theory anymore. So this is kind of like, yeah, fair, yeah. Benny's talk at the EC rump session was a life-changing experience, okay, so tonight at the rump session, please pay attention for life-changing experiences, okay. Then, in Aarhus, the next Eurocrypt, Ivan gets up and says, I'm going to mention it again, sugar beet auctions. <laughs> okay, so there were sugar beet auctions, and you could actually do that. So this was the second life-changing experience at a Eurocrypt rump session. Okay, so this was, and, and it, this was clear you could now do stuff. Okay, you could do stuff that was... Kind, it, was, it was passively secure, so it wasn't fully secure. It was very, you know, the, the sugar beet auction is basically just a lot of comparisons, but you know, a lot of comparisons, okay? So it's just doing a supply command, demand curve thing. So a relatively simple function, passively secure, but you could, it, and it was useful in an application. Okay, so then we started, me, Yehuda, and Benny started working, and what we actually did is we did the first actively secure computation. Okay. We did. A, we compared 16, two 16-bit numbers, and it took two to three minutes to compute. So we did that. I, you know, I was, I, I, da, 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 and um, and so I sent the email to Yehuda. Oh, we've done it. It's completed. Right. Let's write the paper. And Yehuda said, "Why? It doesn't contain anything." And I said, "Well, well, you know." Um, and he said, "All I've done is answer your quest stupid questions about oblivious transfer." And I said, well, all I've done is, is implement these stupid answers you've given me. But we kind of, dis and this is kind of the, the point where actively secure stuff starts, which is kind of interesting. So then the next year, we had to go one better. So we'd compared two 16-bit numbers. So we're kind of going, okay, we need a big challenge. What's the big challenge? So we decided to pick a circuit that all cryptographers love. And we decided to pick AES. Now, we could have picked DES. We could have picked SHA, one, two. We could have picked MD4, MD5. We just had to pick a circuit. Now, the reason for picking AES was because we thought at the time that, A, it would be rather complicated because it's a PRF and therefore the circuit must be very, very complicated as a, as a circuit. 
And B, we kind of saw at the time that it has lots of parallel execution. So we said, if we pick this as the benchmark, then if we come up with optimizations which can exploit parallelism, then we'll see this will encourage people to do research on the parallelism. So we picked AES because it was complicated to implement, we thought, and because there was a high level of parallelism which we thought would be useful in the future as a, as a test bed. It was very complicated to produce because Fair Play couldn't compile that as a circuit because it, it just blew up. And so you, what I had to do was actually compile little bits of the circuit and then stitch them together, correcting the bugs in the circuit that Fair Play had created along the way, work out the random stuff. And this took about, it took about three or four weeks to actually write the circuit down. So we thought, that's complicated. OK. Turns out it's a really bad example. As a, as a complex circuit, because there's lots of mathematical structure in AS, because uh, you know Vincent and Johan did the you know the, the S box is, is not a random S box, it's an inversion because it uses the Nyberg trick of one x goes to one over x to get good differential properties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it took a hundred look at that, 1,148 seconds to implement in an actively secure manner. Okay, remember that. 1,148 seconds for one execution. Okay, this is... Okay, okay. so that's where we were in 2009. And then the research happens. Three million a second for two-party computation, actively secure. It's gone down to 1,148 to 3 million a second we can cope, cope with. Or, oh, so there's a kind of two metrics here. You can look at a throughput or you can look at latency. So de depending on your application, you're kind of interested in, in different metrics. Now, to give you an idea of where you're kind of interested here, if you're thinking of your uh, oblivious PRF as evaluating a PRF for an authentication mechanism, then... The largest bank in Europe, um, we talked to them, and they, uh, uh, in terms of their um, uh, throughputs, um, they need about um, 300 a second with a delay of 20 milliseconds. That's the kind of levels they're, look, they're working up with online access using, using kind of Macs being sent in and out. Not AS Macs, they're DES Macs, but you kind of get an idea of what you would need in, a, in an application for that. And so we're, we're now well, well there at implementing stuff. So um, we saw today, I can't remember which of the 2017 ones we saw this morning. That was the, th the three-party actively secure one this morning. There's all sorts of other two-party actively secure ones have come out this, um, this year. Um, you know, uh, in 2012, we did a 10-party uh, computation. Um, one of my postdocs, Marcel, wherever he is, is currently doing 100-party computations. You know, so we can do really cool stuff with AS, mainly because AS is an easy circuit. Okay. Okay, so um, AS is actually, not, on its own, it's not a, 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 a typical example of block cipher uses. You might, within an MPC system, you might want to look at different... Uh, different forms of, of, of basic PRF. So we're now creating different um, MP, uh, MPC-friendly PRFs, which is kind of, kind of a bit like uh, the low-complexity PRFs you might have for IoT devices. But here you want low-complexity PRFs which act well in secret-sharing-based MPC systems. So in a, in a CCS paper last year, we introduced... Um, uh, uh, well, we, didn't, we introduced a, a, the PRF called, based on the Legendre symbol, Turns out the Legendre symbol is a good PRF, um, and it actually can be, despite it, when you evaluate it normally, is really really hard to evaluate. If you evaluate it with MPC, it's actually really efficient. So it's one, it's an it's an algorithm that you can ev evaluate quicker using multi-party computation than you can evaluate in the clear. Okay, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Um, so then we have there was a, a, a block cipher that was a PRF that was proposed. Um, for, was it fully homomorphic encryption or, or low complexity circuits? I can't remember. Oops. Anyway. Snarks. Snarks. There we go. Yes, so Christian at the back. Um, so Snarks was uh, MIMSI, which is a very, very good one. Um, we also looked at that. And these seem to be the two leading MPC friendly 
block ciphers at the moment, or PRFs. And then we kind of said, well, so in recent, in new work that we're kind of going to put on ePrint in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks, we actually look at different, how the, what modes of operation are MPC friendly, and which PRF works well with the uh, thing. And the reason for this is, is because if you have a database that's actually a distributed database, and it's actually doing stuff on secret shared data, at some point you want to communicate with it and back again. Now there's a trivial way of doing it, of splitting all the data into shares and encrypting them on links back to you. But you might just want to send, I just want to do one piece of work, send some data here, and you want this thing to decrypt it into shares. But you don't want it to use AES, because that's like ugly and horrible and lots of... So you want to do the decryption here easy, in a, in a very fast MPC manner, Whereas you kind of the, the, the person external to the database or the disk where you're storing data can be stored using so, uh, kind of like a modification of the block cipher, which the MPC engine finds easier to process, and you just and, and the, everybody else has a sort of slight extra cost. And there's other work, so there's lots of work in uh, machine learning with AES. This goes back to very early work of Lindell and Pincus. Um, in 2008, and this is now a practical reality. So you can, there's lots of people doing uh, neural networks, or they're doing machine learning, and all sorts of things in MPC. And, and my betting is there's going to be shed loads of papers in this area in the next years. So this is kind of the kind of the obvious where people are going because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people. Uh, you know, I got a phone call from uh, someone advising the US Congress the other day saying we want to kind of combine two databases. How do we do this to get statistical information out? You know, this is going to, people are now seeing this. If you talk in industry, you know, everybody's heard of homomorphic encryption and then everyone goes, oh, but that's too slow. You should use MPC. And everyone goes, oh, really? And then suddenly you get lots more interest. So there's a lot of interest out there. Um, it's kind of cool. Okay, so the future is bright for MPC. And there's lots of investment in the area. If you haven't heard of the investment, you know, basically, money doesn't grow on trees except if you're doing MPC. If you're doing MPC, money really does grow on trees. So um, I kind of estimated this morning that probably the US government's put in well over $100 million worth of investment in this in the last 10 years, just the US government, on the programs I know about. So the Brandeis program is the one that, as I said, is building lots of distributed databases. We're doing stuff with the US Census. Um, here we're working, um, there's, and that's about a $70 million program. The Proceed program, you've probably all heard about, that was the one that did homomorphic encryption and, and other stuff. There was SPA, which was funded by ARPA, and there's lots of others. I'm sure Rafi could tell me a huge list of ones that I probably missed. Then, closer to home, the ERC, that's the European Research Council, for those of you that are not European, um, that, that's put a lot of investment in MPC, and these are just the people who this morning I could remember who they were, and B, on their blurb, on their website, or something to do with it, there was something relevant to MPC within their project, okay? So there's um, uh, Ronald at the back, has got an ERC, uh, Ivan's been doing stuff here, Yehuda, I think, is on his second ERC grant, um, uh, Jasper's doing this. Uh, David Poncheval on his ERC grant mentioned something to be something to do with cloudy MPC stuff. Um, I've on my second ERC grant, it's just like churn. Okay, um, we've got lots of right, so that's the kind of theoretical end of European funding. On the applied end of European funding, there is an endless list of projects that have been doing MPC over the years. Um, here's just a few of them. Um, Probably the projects here miss a lot of projects that involved SAP. SAP did a lot of work here looking at supply chain management. I just couldn't list, I couldn't find the projects that had SAP in because the websites, I just couldn't, couldn't do the search, but there we go. Um, there's lots of VC funding in this space and there's lots of national funding. So I know Denmark government's put a lot of money in, UK government's put a lot of money in. There's a lot of money in this space um, if you want to do kind of cool research. Okay. Other applications of MPC. Okay, so uh, yesterday um, uh, FX was talking about masking inside channels. Masking inside channels is essentially MPC. It's it's computing on secret shared data. Okay, this goes back. Um, it's kind of this is a really nice cool link between the TCC community and the Chess community. So you have the wire probe model of Ishai, Sahai, and Wagner. You have the TI multipliers. Um, in so that's like more on the TCC side, although it appeared in Czech crypto, I think. Um, but then actually on the practical kind of circuit level, you have the TI multipliers of Vincent and Svetler and lots of others. And these things are being combined, and different theoretical models, etc. 
And there's lots of potential er uh, applications in this area. You could apply much more MPC-style theory to Chez-style applications, or you could kind of look at more side-channel kind of issues to do with MPC. It's just kind of there's all sorts of stuff you could do. Okay, so what we have, um, so we started in the 1980s, 1990s, and kind of when I started into crypto, it was a waste of time paying attention. And then, and this is why it had to be like that, so I could have my lovely, <laughs> where's Motti go? Okay, yeah, there's, there's so I have that. And now we've got a bunch of various companies in the, in, 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 in the space. So actually the lesson is, all what for the youngsters, is always turn up to lots of talks, always pay attention, don't fall asleep, okay, because that's really bad, very bad, okay. No one's asleep here, good. So there's a bunch of, of companies here, and these are just the ones that I knew about at the time. So Baffle are a new company. They were at the RSA um, uh, Innovation Sandpit this year. Partizia are from Denmark. Dadek are from Israel, apparently. Um, Cybernetica are the Estonian company. Cpure are also in Denmark. Google did some stuff, and they talked about their MPC stuff at... Real World Crypto this year. Galois are the people who do the stuff with DARPA and stuff, and they were talked about. Um, Gilles talked about them yesterday because they produce the crypto languages, so which is kind of like a Haskell-based stuff. And they've got, they have, they've developed Haskell interfaces into the speed, our speed system, so they can kind of do kind of much more higher-level program analysis type stuff. Okay, so <coughs> some more some more summary. Okay, try to implement theoretical stuff. Pick at a theory paper and try and do it. It's because you're going to fail nine times out of ten, but the one time out of ten, it actually might make your career. Okay? Um, theory's going to stay theory until someone does it, and that's a real shame. That's a real shame, because that's I, 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 a real problem. On the other hand, theoreticians should welcome, welcome people implementing their stuff and not say this paper contains no new theory, because actually someone implementing their stuff is showing that they care. Okay, so you kind of like kind of have a warm, fuzzy feeling about that. Um, and practical people should not be antagonistic towards the theoreticians, okay, because the practical people need always more problems to work on. Because as soon as your work has got to the bottom right hand side of that graph, no one cares because it's deployed in products and it's no longer research. Yeah? So if you want to stay doing research and don't want to end up in a company, you've got to start looking at the theory stuff. Or you could end up at IBM, Christian, I know. <laughs> Whatever, okay. Okay, and doing this process actually tests how far theory is away from research. Okay, it also turns up what are the correct theoretical problems to be working with. So when we initially did the stuff on Yao circuits and we tried to do the AS computations, you know, we suddenly realized for that kind of circuit, the oblivious transfer is just kind of like pointless. It's just so fast, who cares? Yeah, so it's actually moving, it was all the other stuff that was more interesting, making the size of the garbled circuit much smaller, and stuff that people hadn't really kind of thought about. So actually doing it actually introduces new theoretical problems that you want to reduce. Um, it also introduces much more new practical implementation problems. How are you going to implement the, the, the garbling function? How are you going to um, ex, uh, evaluate in a secret sharing based system the, um, doing a fixed point or a floating point operation? You know, it's kind of, and also the kind of the, the mantra that is definitely said by practical MPC people at the moment is forget about circuits, don't do circuits, circuits are wrong, circuits are the wrong model of computation because all the secret sharing based systems got rid of circuits years ago, so anyone who still thinks circuits are important in secret sharing based systems is just barking up the wrong tree, so we actually got a better understanding of what the basic primitives in MPC are. Okay, um, a really, really good example of this, and I'm going to disagree with Phil here. So Phil's uh, invited talk, which was at Asia Crypt in New Zealand, I think, um, he talked about um, he didn't like military funding of, uh, of, 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 of crypto. He thought that was a bad idea. Um, actually, I think military, the, the DARPA programs have actually been really good at spurring theoreticians and practical people to work together, and almost all of the applications that we've looked at within the programs have been civilian. So at no point am I aware that we have produced some piece of technology that is now used to do whatever, not ne nephorous or horrible stuff. So it might be, I don't know, but we're essentially, we're, we're all good eggs and we've been doing nice stuff. And Phil will say we're all just naive idiots, but, and that might be true. But I think the benefit to the crypto community of this has been actually quite astounding. Okay, summary, there's a huge amount of work to do. 
we want to, uh, you know, we want to be able to do real computations in real time. There's a great mix of theory and practice. This is a great area to move into. Um, we need more people working in this area. We need more practical people working in this area. We need more theoreticians who are... In, I'm talking to the theory side at the moment. We need more theoreticians that are working, um, that want to get involved in practical problems. We need more practical people who are interested in working in theoretical problems. If interested, come and see me and insert the usual job advert at this point. <laughs> OK. And I'm going to end it there. Any questions? Thank you. So one short notice, uh, Michelle wants to give an announcement about the ROM session, so when we later, after the questions, thank Nigel and Ken, please don't get up and start leaving, but stay and give Michelle a chance to give an announcement, okay? Uh, questions? Well, what we see is that crypto and security are a lot about the trust models. In um, MPC or 2PC, 2PC is kind of easy. You have two, two guys who don't trust each other. In MPC, you have many. And, and I think that's, uh, there's more research there also to be done, especially when it comes to these fuzzy trust models like that we have today with blockchain. So I'm looking forward to hearing about blockchain and MPC as well. There's lots of work on blockchains and MPC already. So there's lots of people using blockchains for MPC. And there's kind of lots, lots of really interesting stuff with blockchain, with rational crypto, Rash, not rash, rational crypto. Because it's kind of it's almost like you're relying on some, an economic model. You're kind of relying on people acting rationally. So I think it's kind of a really cool area. Oh, Adi. So at the practical end of the uh, uh, survey, you described uh, how easy it is to get money and the large number of companies that had been established. Somehow I didn't hear about the uh, killer applications which are coming out and uh, either uh, uh, which exist today or which you foresee in the next few years. Uh, so uh, will they be extensions of the uh, sugar beet uh, auctions or totally new kind of uh, applications? Okay, so that's kind of interesting. So the, uh, let's try and think, okay. I'm thinking so I don't forget anybody, okay? So this, I don't want to upset anyone, right. Okay, so currently I see we essentially have three types of applications that are being deployed, being used, or being envisaged. So the first one is extensions of sugar beet. So Partesia does a lot of stuff with uh, um, different forms of, of markets and auctions. And it's, it's kind of interesting is that it's not just about you know, the, 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 the closed bid auction, there's all sorts of different ones you can do. I think you do something with the electricity markets and stuff, yeah, so, um, so there's, there's, there's that. And actually, when we started looking at applications in, in, in Bristol, um, the, okay, a side rather cool story, go talk to a tech company in the UK, okay, it's, it's a small survey, UK tech companies, it's really tiny, yeah, okay, and you try and phone up and say, I've got a cool piece of tech, and you go, and they basically don't get a response, okay? Phone up someone in the financial services sector, where obviously all the clever people work in the UK, and you end up at bald level discussions where once you've explained the dining banker's problem, which is like the millionaire's problem, but it's about who pays for lunch, who's got the biggest bonus, yeah? They suddenly go, oh, we have that problem every day, and then they really understand it. <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out that, um, that yeah, so, so you can get into very, very high level, senior board level things in uh, uh, dark pool market suppliers and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff there on financial uh, uh, trading, et cetera, where you want to keep the bids slow, uh, fast, but the problem is at the moment everything's slightly a bit too slow. Okay, so it's fast, but not fast enough because they do high frequency trading as well. And there's also issues with regulation there, which are a bit of an issue. But there's a lot of stuff, financial or marketing stuff. The other application, which is, okay, so there's a problem with MPC. This is my other story. Problem with MPC is the, top, the title. Multi-party computation. If you want to sell something, you sell, need to sell to multiple parties. So you have to simultaneously convince two customers that they want to do something with their data, sell them the system, and then get them to talk to each other. That's a hard sell. So Yehuda's great insight was, I remember 
we were sitting on a balcony in, in overlooking a Tel Aviv uh, beach, which is always a good place to go. And then so, and, and he apparently saw the pound signs revolving around my eyes when he said, actually what you need is you need to actually look at one customer and you take their data and you split it into two as, because that's a kind of uh, 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 a threat mitigation style. So that's essentially what Dyadic does. It does it's, you take a single piece of data and you split it and there, we do it with cryptographic keys, but we, can also do it, we also do it with databases and other things, uh, biometric information, etc. So that's the other killer app, is where you've got some secret on your network and you want to protect it. You can, in some sense, traditionally you'd put it in an HSM, but sometimes the HSM might not be able to do the functionality you want, so you need the data to be processed by some computer, and so you are processing it by some computer, so you have to reveal it. But if you do it with MPC, you don't reveal the data. So that's the other killer app. And then the third killer app is essentially typified by Cybernetica and by um, the Brandeis program and sort of the things that governments are interested in. Is you've got two databases, you want to bring the two databases together and you want to get some statistical information or some extra added value of bringing the two databases together. And there you see Cybernetica have had some uh, demos, they do some stuff in with the Estonian stuff, uh, government, and you see some applications coming up in the States. And that seems... To me, that's, that, that's the kind of the, the, the golden thing, you know, one drug database, another drug database, we combine them, we get information, you know, so it's what the theoreticians always say about this is what MPC is going to be useful for. But actually, the problem there is actually, how do you actually have a route to market for that application? But other things coming up will be more machine learning type stuff. I, I think that's going to be really big. So, yeah. I wouldn't dismiss auctions so quickly. Because Google yeah. executes yeah. billions of auctions a day. Mm in a trusted party model right now. Yeah. But you know, increasing transparency on those would have value. Yeah. Come see us. I'm sure we can sell you something. <laughs> <laughs> Google. Google, they're a small company, aren't they? I'm, what, what do they do? <laughs> so how do you reconcile Intel's SGX and trusted platform, which could possibly do everything that uh, you're claiming is the killer application for MPC? But it doesn't at the moment, does it? I mean, it's kind of it's a way of doing it. And actually, if you look at the SGX trusted platform, it's actually in the Rivest paper on homomorphic encryption. It's kind of interesting that, um, but there, well, not quite what SGX is, but this idea of doing homomorphic encryption, um, do, doing computing on encrypted data within the processor. And the reason they dismissed it in the original, this is kind of really cool, the reason they dis dismissed it in the original um, FHE paper was that the DES circuit would delay the amount of uh, the, the time needed to encrypt and decrypt as you went from memory backwards and forwards. Now, because you have risk style architecture since, you only have, you try to minimize your input and output from memory. And actually, the memory access now on a processor is really slow. The AES decryption doesn't do anything. It, you don't see any delay. So it's kind of an interesting that you go back to a paper from the 1977. 78, whenever it was, and it, this is now actually like a, a deployed technology that Intel are doing, but it was actually part of theoretical crypto back in 78, which is kind of really cool. Um, but I think it, I mean, this is, so we, we're actually using SGX um, to harden some of our implementations, so I think it's a complementary technology. I think all these things are kind of, security is hard, you need multiple things to come together and, you know, multiple products and, and stuff, multiple technologies will work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so the, the only reason I had very distinguished in there is because that's, that's where the benchmarks are. So uh, it's, it's really easy to dis delineate the benchmarks of passive and active. But there's a lot of stuff which are the covert security models which make a lot of sense. Um, again, if you look at kind of like a sort of rational model, you know, covert security works because you kind of rationally believe that people are going to fo don't want to be caught. So if you kind of create incentives which are outside the system for people to follow a protocol, then you can do a cheaper one. So, you know, um, so yeah, so it depends kind of on the application domain. 
You know, so if you're, if you're doing a, an auction system, passive is probably okay because everybody wants to engage and, you know, and they don't want to put an overbid because if they overbid, well, you know, if they underbid or they, they kind of screw the protocol over and nothing's going to be assigned, you know, so it's kind of like they actually want the auction to occur. So it might be an economic incentive for them to engage. So it might not necessarily be necessary to have uh, uh, active security for auctions, but covert will be fine. So I think, yeah, things are di yeah, different applications are different. Yes, so uh, comments. So first, I worked on uh, auction security in Google in the ad exchange and uh, when it was a piece of paper and uh, in order to do the ad exchange, you need the advertising agencies to sign up and it was very important to tell them that if they encrypt their bid, we can do verification offline later if they don't trust us and uh, it will cost them a little bit more. It was very crucial for them for signing up, but uh, just saying this make them believe that uh, Google will behave honestly and that it was not implemented eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, mental power of cryptography. <laughs> the, uh, the second thing is that uh, what are the killer apps? The killer apps, uh, nobody knows exactly the killer apps, but uh, we are in the world of the web. And the web uh, has many collaborations uh, which are multi-companies and they need the data and sometimes they will go offline and verify that they've been done things right. And same thing with the cloud. You don't trust the cloud fully and uh, there, are, there are situations that you will go again offline and check that the cloud was actually doing the, the work. So these are two directions to think about where the killer apps will come from. Yeah, so you, you had kind of the ski slope of going from theory to practice and you walked through kind of the, the MPC and the FHE examples. Do you think it will take us longer to go down the slope for kind of the current really theoretical stuff like IO because it's getting a little further out there? Or are we going to get sort of better at going down and so we can start to, to have a faster cycle? I think, I think, I, I think FHE was kind of um, uh, uh, was a really good, in interesting example in that we actually got the slope starting really quickly and then halfway down we hit a barrier. And I think, I think what's going to happen is that now we know we should do that. If we have a really big theoretical thing, we just should p spend dollars to get people to implement stuff and just see how far they get down. I think, um, so I think, that, you know, we would have sped up MPC dramatically if we'd thought about that in the 90s. So, so I, I think we've learned our lesson. For IO, I think, it's kind of interesting. It's, we seem to, uh, one of the problems with IO is that essentially we're also roadblocked by the FHE. Yeah, so I if we had a breakthrough in FHE, we'd probably, in, in terms of implementation speed, we'd probably be able to get a speed improvement in the existing IO solutions. Um, if you wanted new IO solutions, I think actually kind of actually doing some implementation and testing ideas is really good because that really allows a good feedback loop into the theoreticians. So we're involved in a, um, uh, a project with this, which is also DARPA funded, called Safeware, which I know a number of you are involved in, which is also trying to replicate this kind of virtuous cycle, trying to get theory, get it into practice, try and get the practice to look at potential applications, then feed that back into theory and replicate that, that kind of virtuous cycle as quickly as possible. But now we know that's the way to take crypto theory to crypto practice rapidly, or to get us to a point where we know We've now got another theoretical barrier we need to look at. I think I think this is going to we're going to get much better at it. 